Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the wonderful world of nomenclature. So what we're going to talk about in this video is how can we name binary ionic compounds? So first things first, how can you even tell if a compound contains ionic bonds? Well, an ionic bond is going to form between a cation and an anion. One of each. If you have a bond, it's only going to happen between two atoms. Um, or two species, I guess you could say. If you're going to have a bond, it's going to happen between two things. And then one atom or one species can experience multiple bonds at a time. But each individual bond is happening between those two atoms. So typically, when does this happen? It usually happens for a metal and a non-metal atom. But what you um, will see in assignment uh, 3.4 about polyatomic ions is that you can have a, an ionic compound that is experienced by just straight up nonmetals. But we're going to focus right now on the metal nonmetal situation here with our binary ionic compounds. So an ionic bond is going to form between a cation and an anion. And for us, we're taking a look at these binary situations first. What does the prefix bi mean to you? Hopefully you said two. Yeah. So what we're talking about here is a two atom ionic compound. Or two types of atoms, I should say. So a two, let me swip, switch this two types of atoms, ionic compound. So, <coughs> excuse me, how does an ionic compound form? How does an ionic bond form? It happens because there is a full transfer of electrons. One atom completely gives up its access to electrons. The other atom completely takes those electrons from it. And why? Well, why would any bond form? Because we're trying to become more stable. Specifically here, especially, we're trying to fill our valent shell. We are happiest, we are most stable when our valent shell is filled. So when you think of ionics, I want you to think about transfer of valence electrons. This is your most important word here, transfer. So um, let's do a little example together. Let's say we had lithium and oxygen and these two things wanted to form a bond. So let me draw you out a Bohr model. Here we've got lithium, three electrons total, one valence. Now let's say we've got oxygen. Uh, we got eight electrons total, six of them are valence. So in order um, for these things to try and achieve stability, we're going to either lose or gain electrons. And it's based off of the type of atom we are, right? So if we're a metal like lithium, lithium wants to give up one of its valence electrons so it can go down to having n equals 1 as its filled valence shell. So it's very happy to take this little electron and give it to oxygen, who really wants to gain an electron to fill its valence shell. So lithium is going to give oxygen its little electron to fill the hole in its heart, and lithium is very happy to do so. But if you take a look at oxygen, oxygen's only got seven valence electrons now, which means it is not yet stable. So how do we fix it? We just add in another lithium. So let me copy this over here. Oh, or completely get rid of it. Okay. Okay. So what can happen is we can have another lithium that comes along and this lithium is also happy to give up its valence electron to fill the hole in oxygen's heart. And it's gonna do that by putting it right over here. Now, both of the lithiums and the oxygen are stable because they have their entire valence shell filled. And how did it happen? Because lithium fully gave up access to that electron and oxygen fully took in access to that electron. So I'm going to redraw this now 
to show you what it actually looks like when these things bond. It's not like lithium just like gives up its electron and it's like, bye, I never have to see you again. No, it's stuck. It's hold, it holds on to oxygen. It's going to hang around. So what does that actually look like? Well, lithium gave up that electron and now it's going to have an ion charge because it has less electrons than it did before. Ugh, whatever, I'll just redraw you. If you're gonna be finicky. So since lithium has um, only two electrons now, it lost one, it's going to have an ion charge of plus one. So we're gonna write that in here. Lithium is left with a plus one charge because this lithium formed a bond with this oxygen. So it's hanging out, it's sticking around, it's staying together. This lithium did the same thing, so I'm gonna draw that little dashed line in right there and give this lithium another positive charge. Oxygen gained two valence electrons, which means that this thing is gonna have a minus two charge. And we're gonna write ourselves a note that these little dashed lines represent our ionic bond. And what actually is a bond? Why um, is it a physical thing? Well, yeah, it's made up of two electrons that are um, being transferred to one of the atoms. But how are things staying in place? It's not necessarily for something physical. It's all about that force of attraction. So really, this ionic bond is a force of attraction that is holding these atoms together in place. Can we separate it? Can we break them up? We actually can, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. So when these things form their compound, in order to make everything stable, you're going to, when you write out its formula, it's telling you that this is my fragment of this little ionic crystal where everything that's um, in this situation is happy and stable and it's got filled valent shells. So you have to continue transferring electrons until everything in your system is stable. So how many lithiums did I need to do that? Two. I had to have two lithiums that each gave up one electron to the one oxygen in this compound um, to make everything stable. So when you go to write this formula, you write it as lithium two oxide, Li2O. I needed two lithiums for every one oxygen. But this does take quite a lot of work, right? To draw out these Bohr models, to show the transferring of electrons, to actually like justify why these things are forming what they're forming. So we're going to find a quicker and easier way to go through this process that I'm going to show you right now. So this is actually really, really important for you to know how to name these things. As if you're in any sort of lab setting and I say, hey, go grab the sodium chloride, you're going to be like, oh yeah, that's the thing that's labeled NaCl. So uh, we are going to figure out how we actually can go between formulas and names, names and formulas. So first things first, let's do this with our little example. The example that we're going to use is sodium chloride. Your first step is to identify the cation and the anion. So identify the cat and the an. This is just kind of helping to orient you. This step is something that's like a throwaway step once you get quicker at this, right? But it's just kind of orienting yourself. What do you have present in this formula? So sodium is going to be our cation. This is our metal. Chloride is going to be your anion. This comes from your non-metal here. So now that we've identified that, our next step is to write these things as their charged ions. Okay. So if I have sodium, the, the chemical formula for sodium is Na, and if I want to write it as an ion, I need to think about how many valence electrons does it have? It has one, so it's going to lose that one valence electron, and when it does, what's the resulting charge? One plus. It's got one less electron than proton, so it's got a leftover with a plus one charge. Now I do the same thing for chlorine. So chlorine comes from the chloride ion. It's got seven valence electrons. It needs to gain one. So it's going to be the formula Cl1 minus. 
these two things as their ions are separated. They are not together, but when they're written like this in this formula, sodium chloride, no spaces between, this tells you they are chemically bonded. They're no longer their ions. So how do we um, approach figuring out the formula? Step three, you balance charges to determine the ratio of ions required to make a neutral compound. So again, the whole point of this is to achieve neutrality. So if you take a look at sodium, it's charges one plus. If you look at chlorine, it's charges one minus. That's kind of like a match made in heaven, right? Sodium wants to give one, chlorine wants to take one. So what's the ratio to make this a neutral compound? I only need one of each thing, which is really nice. If you have a one-to-one -one ratio, so if ratio is one-to-one, -one, then already balanced. This makes it really nice for us because we don't really have to do any work. We only need one of each ion to come together. So our formula is going to be NaCl, one sodium, one chloride ion. So what happens if our lives are not this easy? What happens if we don't have this nice one-to-one -one ratio? Well, let's do an example to see how we deal with that. The example we're going to get is strontium. nitride. All right, first step, let's orient ourselves. We've got our cation right here. We've got our anion right here. So our next step is to then write these as their charged ions. So strontium symbol is SR. It's got two valence electrons that it wants to lose, so the resulting charge is going to be 2 plus. Nitride comes from nitrogen. So this is capital N, um, nitrogen's got five valence electrons. It wants to gain three. So when it does, its resulting charge is going to be three minus. So these things are not a one-to-one -one ratio. This is not as nice. So there are two ways that you can approach this. The first one tells you why it is the way it is. The second one is your cheat sheet way. So I'm going to show you number one first because this is why this works. First one you can do is uh, balance with LCM, least common multiple. Hi math, missed you. So if you take a look at strontium, it's got a two plus charge, whoa. Nitrogen's got a three minus charge. So let's think to ourselves, what is the least common multiple between two and three? Six. If you get stuck, remember multiple means you've got more than one of these things, right? So if you get stuck, just start counting. Two, four, six. Three, six, ooh, six, six, same number, least common multiple. So I need my six positives to be equal to my six negatives. So let's figure out the ratio of ions we need to get there. Well, each strontium has a two plus charge. So I need three strontiums to get to six positives. Each nitrogen has a three minus charge. So I need two nitrogens to get to six negatives. This is my ratio. I need three strontium ions per two nitride ions to make a neutral compound. So how do I write this? I need three strontiums and two nitrides. And now I will have a neutral compound. So here's our answer, SR3N2. So remember all the way back in unit one when we first learned how to count atoms, this is where that comes from. I told you you would learn why these formulas are the way that they are, and this is why they wait. This is why they are the way they are. If you have strontium and nitride, this is an ionic compound. It's all about balancing out that charge to make what's called our ionic crystal or our formula unit. So how can I do this a different way? Well, number two, you can use the crisscross. You have to say it like that every time you do it. Crisscross. 
Um, so crisscross, this is your cheat sheet method. This is your like put an asterisk next to it method because it's not always going to work as nicely how we want it to. And I will show you an example of that. So the way that the crisscross works is this is like a quick cheat sheet way for you to get the ratio that you need between your ions based on their charges. So again, strontium's got a two plus charge, nitride's got a three minus charge. What we can do is we can write this as a little skeleton next to each other as if they're gonna bond. And what's gonna happen is the magnitude of the charge for each of these is going to crisscross to become the subscript for the opposite ion. So the magnitude of the cation charge is two. Magnitude just means number. So when I crisscross this and bring it down, it becomes the subscript for nitride. For nitrogen, its um, magnitude of its charge is three. So when I crisscross this, it becomes a subscript of three for strontium. And what do I end up with? The exact same formula that I did before, SR3N2. Same these. So your crisscross is your really quick method. It does help a lot. It makes things go a lot faster. You can start doing these things in your head, but you do really have to check yourself. Until you are so amazing at ionic compounds, you have to be really careful with this crisscross method because it might lead you astray, and I will show you an example of that in a second. So what happens if you've got um, something that shows up in that periwinkle section, right? Anything that's blocked off in that periwinkle color on our periodic table here, all of those um, can experience multiple charges. So you have to be able to figure out what the heck is the charge on that ion. Here's how you do it. You have to choo, 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 look at the anion, oops, look at the anion that your cation is bonded to. Remember, anion charges don't change. They're reliable. They're going to want to keep gaining electrons until their valence shell is filled. So anion charges don't change. The only ones that can change are those cations that show up in that periwinkle collar. So let's say that I have the formula Ti3n. Titanium is an element that shows up right here on the periodic table. So it can experience multiple charges. And if I wanted to go find the name of this thing, because it can experience multiple charges, I have to use the Roman numerals to do that. So if I need to figure out what Roman numeral I'm going to put in the name, I need to know the charge on titanium. So I can figure this out by employing the backwards crisscross method. But again, this only sometimes works. So if I were to take this thing, titanium and nitride, it came from the, its ions, its separated ions of titanium and nitride. So what I can do is I can take the subscript for each of these things and backwards crisscross them to figure out the charge. If I do this, this would imply that titanium has a one plus charge and nitride has a three minus charge. But I can't just rely on this. I have to check myself. And how do you check yourself? You check the anion. Look to see if your anion is correct. Because again, it doesn't change. So if I use the backwards crisscross method, this says that nitride has a minus three charge. Does it? Yes, it does. Nitride's got a minus three charge, tells us right there. So what this means is this, re this method is reliable in this case. I can use it. The charge on titanium will in fact be one plus. For every one nitrogen, for every one nitride that's got a three minus charge, I need three titaniums, each with a plus one charge to get these things to cancel out. What happens if I gave you this 
thing is still titanium and nitrogen. But now, titanium's got a different charge because I've got different subscripts here. So again, let's separate it. Titanium, nitride. If I backwards crisscross, this, char this subscript of one on titanium would imply that nitride has a one minus charge. So let's check ourselves. Does nitrogen have a one minus charge? No, no, it does not. This is where the backwards crisscross lies to you. It is entirely possible that if something has a one to one ratio, like we're seeing here, we're gonna cancel everything down so that way it appears in the lowest whole number ratio in our little ionic formula unit. So TIN, is not titanium with a one plus charge and nitride with a one minus charge. Instead, we have to check ourselves. The charge on nitride never changes. It's always three minus, which means how did I get here? Well, I only have one nitride ion, which means I, and if I look at the formula, I only have one titanium ion. So if these things are in a one to one ratio, it means they have the same charge, just equal and opposite. So this means titanium has a three plus charge in this case. So this is where you have to be careful. Your backwards crisscross can fail you here. So write yourself a note. Always check anion. Don't let yourself fall into the trap. Don't let yourself forget. So, um, if we wanted to take something like this and then go from the, uh, the name to the formula, you have to make sure to check your rules. Start with number one, is it ionic? Everything in this practice that will be because I'm teaching how to name ionics. Um, then decide, is the cation a periwinkle or a non-periwinkle? Does it have multiple charges? Does it not have multiple charges? That's going to determine your rule, right? So um, I am going to challenge you to pause the video here, fill out these four practice problems, and then come on back to check your answers to see if you can figure out using one of the methods, crisscross or the least common multiple, um, to get these names into their appropriate formulas. Pause, pause, pause. Choo, choo, choo. Okay. All right, so... Um, I am going to quickly walk you through the, the reason why I picked some of these ones because they're a little bit tricky. Calcium had to come from Ca2+, plus, that's the calcium ion. Sulfide is S2- minus as the ion. So when you put these things together, if you were to crisscross, you would get Ca2S2. But remember, trick, 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 one-to-one -one ratio. So we reduce it to CAS. That's the formula you should have gotten. Silver I picked because silver is the one of the ones that's a little bit tricky. Remember, it is in the transition metal block. It is in the D block, but it itself can only experience one possible charge. So silver's got a plus one, Ag plus oxi oxide has a two minus charge. So when you put them together to figure out your ratio, you need two silvers for every one oxygen to get something neutral. That should be your formula. Iron two nitride. Um, Roman numerals tell you the charge. So Fe's got a two plus, nitride's got a three minus. When you crisscross or least common multiple, you end up with Fe3N2. And lastly, cobalt three phosphide. Cobalt here has a three plus charge, thanks to the Roman numerals for telling us that. Phosphide's got a three minus. When you put them together, again, it's a one to one ratio and you get COP, COP. Okay, so what if I want to go backwards? What if I want to write the name from the given formula? Good news. You already know how to do this. If you know how to name monatomic ions, you know how to name ionic compounds. Easy peasy. When they're monatomic ions, they're separated, but when they're an ionic compound, they just come together. They're no longer ions, so you can name them the same way and just take off the word ion. So, Here's your kind of set of rules. First, write the name of the cation. No changes. Same as before. Then you write the name of the anion. Make sure it's got that ied ending, I-D-E. So let's practice. So CAS, this is an example that I actually gave you right above. So we know its name is going to be calcium sulfide. Let's figure out how I got there. So 
CAS had to come from CA2+. So let's think about how we name this. If you forgot, go back to your naming monatomic ions rules. So it's this name because it's a cation. It's just going to keep its elemental name calcium. And since it's an ion, we add in the word ion. S2- uh, this is an anion, so our anion rules tell us its name is sulfide ion. But when these things come together to bond to make CAS, they're no longer ions, so we literally just have to remove the word ion. And now its name is calcium sulfide. So that's where this process is coming from. And once again... I'm going to keep harping on this because I see this mistake happen a lot with students. If a metal can make more than one possible ion, how do we tell people the charge on it? Roman numerals. Roman numerals. Yay. Make this like so obvious so you do not forget. <laughs> so if something can make uh, more than one charge, you're going to write the names just like this, right? Put that Roman numeral in parentheses. You got it. Let's practice. Okay, I'm going to do one of these with you, and I'm going to leave the other ones for you to do on your own. I'm going to pick this little cutie right here. Okay, C-U-2-O. All right, let's see if we can figure out the... Um, Order for naming this, Cu2O. I see a metal in there, it's ionic. Also, it's in the ionic nomenclature video. It's ionic, okay, now I have to ask myself, what's my cation, what's my anion? My cation is copper, Cu. Is this a periwinkle? Yes, it is. So it can experience multiple charges, great. Now I gotta find the charge on copper. So, Cu. Oh, split it up. Can I backwards crisscross? Is this going to be reliable? Well, if I do that, the two subscript from copper is going to come up to be a two minus charge on oxygen. Check myself. Does oxygen experience a two minus charge? Yes, it does. It does not change. It is always two minus. Good to go. The backwards crisscross is reliable. All right, so I got a subscript of one on oxygen, backwards crisscross that. That gets me a charge of one plus on copper. So when I go to write this, how do I name Cu one plus? Well, that's copper one. Perfect. How do I name oxygen? Well, I name it oxide. Perfect. So this thing's name is copper one oxide. All right, try these last few. If you need some extra practice problems, I posted so many for you. Um, check back with the answer key, and then you're ready to move on to molecular compounds. What, what?